Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the AAS YouTube channel. And this is part of the good stuff. This is the Sky and Telescope series. And I'm very happy to have author Oleg Boyevich with us today. Hey, Oleg. Hi. 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 <laughs> Where are you at? I am in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. Oh, okay. Okay. So we're, we're still in uh, deep in the winter there in Ontario. It's, yeah. It's pretty cold here and very snowy. Ottawa is a very snowy city. Mm. Do you ski? Yeah, cross country mostly. Cross country, yeah, very good, very good. Yeah. So as long as you're doing astronomy, do you ever take like a small telescope or something with you while you go ski and you go out? Yeah, that's a possibility, definitely. Okay. Especially in the winter, we have, you know, Orion in the sky and all those yeah. nebulas. Uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> Uh, that is a pretty awesome image over your right shoulder, and I'm guessing why is it like segmented? Well, uh, it's an image of the moon, and uh, usually we have uh, maybe a couple of weeks of good seeing in the moon uh, in Ottawa. Okay. In uh, in fall, like September. It was this image was taken from September 11 to September 17, uh. 2017. And uh, each image is uh, is a weekday. So the first image was taken on Monday, then okay. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Got it. Yeah, just to show, it's basically a lunar week. Mm -hmm. It shows uh, how the Terminator mo moves on the moon. So I chose the segmented, you know, image to to show how the Terminator actually moves. That's very cool. So you made that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the. One trick has been to undo the libration of the moon mm -hmm. because if you try to combine it, won't, it won't match. Because right. the moon, you know, just goes like this all the time. So. Levels. <laughs> yeah, very cool. Very nice. Very nice. Ah, uh, okay, Oleg. Um, how did you get into astronomy? Uh, it's been my passion since childhood. Um, I remember when I was a teenager and we lived in Siberia and I wanted to observe a, a lunar eclipse mm -hmm. in the middle of Siberian winter, the temperatures mm -hmm. below minus 40. Yeah, see. <laughs> uh, and so I was watching the moon through a self-made telescope and uh, my parents were watching me, so I wouldn't freeze to death. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, at the time, my capabilities of getting a telescope, getting my hands on a telescope were severely limited. And uh, I just take, took a cardboard tube, uh, a lens from eyeglasses, one diopter, one meter focal length, uh, a camera lens, nifty 50. And I got myself a telescope with magnification of 20 and it's F by 20, I think. Wow. It was good enough to observe the moon. And I saw yeah. those craters and you know, lunar seas and I was hooked. Very cool. Then there was a huge break for like 37 years. So finally, five years ago, I told myself, you know, I'm a big boy now. I can afford a decent telescope. So I went to an astronomy store that we have here in Ottawa and got myself a um, uh, five inch Evo star refractor. Mm -hmm. And then it just, uh, it just took off. It was, uh, it was a great journey. Cool. And it's still ongoing. Yeah. Yeah. So photography is a great, it's a great hobby because it combines this, you know, it requires you to be technically knowledgeable and yet at the same time, you should have like this arty side. To it's you. art, right? There's, there's definitely an art to it. Um, right. Yeah, yeah, it's really cool. Especially when it comes to processing. A uh, lot depends on the processing uh -huh. because, uh, you know, our eyes are not very suited for observing sky targets. Our eyes have evolved to observe terrestrial you know, things that can eat us or we can eat, basically for that kind of thing. <laughs> but yeah, uh, astronomical was... objects have this huge dynamic range of many orders of magnitude, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, the wavelength range is also much bigger than we can see. Our eyes can see only maybe two orders of magnitude of dynamic range once they're accommodated, that is. So, um, so when you look at, at astronomical objects by your eyes, you see something dim and kind of almost on the edge of your imagination mm -hmm. when you make an image however you have possibility to enhance it right to bring out all the faint details 
So since you cannot see the same details with your naked eye, the question becomes of where do you stop with the processing, right? Yeah. Because you can't see it anyway. So where do you stop? What kind of colors you use? And so on. Uh, so that's where the art part of this right. hobby comes into play naturally. Right. right. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. So um, when did you, so you grew up in Siberia and when did you move to Canada? Did you do that as a kid or were you already a... a... Uh, 25 years ago, uh, okay. we moved to Toronto and then to Ottawa. Okay, cool. Awesome. We lived in the States actually four or five years in Michigan. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Very cool. And that, everyone, is going to take us to this really lovely, gorgeous, Sky and Telescope article on imaging science, choosing an astrograph. And Oleg, this is in the April uh, 2021. Oleg, take us away. Sure. Um, basically, what I found when I began my hobby and uh, I wanted to pick a telescope, I was overwhelmed very quickly by the kinds of telescopes available you know, the optical designs, sizes, you know, you name it. So basically uh, what I wanted to convey in this article is to basically help somebody who just like me wants to buy an astrograph and be begin astrophotography, mm -hmm. what to pay attention to and how to choose your first telescope. Cool. Um, there are a lot of articles out there who describe different brands of telescopes and, you know, new models, but that doesn't help when you want to pick between existing, you know, what's on the market. And um, so at, at that time, you have a lot of questions like, is it go, is hobby, this hobby going to work with me? Like maybe I'm not willing to invest a lot of money up front and so on. So how to begin such that you can actually t make most of out of your money and yet uh, get decent images. Cool. So basically, uh, um, uh, my first question was like, what do you want to get out of this? I even went as far as posted a questionnaire on a Facebook uh, astronomy group asking astrophotographers why they do it. And okay. most people said, I want to convey my fascination with the night sky. Okay. So basically, uh, when you go out there in the night sky, the dark sky location, you feel this milky way across the sky, it, you feel like almost you're in a temple. You feel this exhilaration and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, sense of awe that you, mm -hmm. you would feel when you're like in an art gallery or, you know, maybe even in a temple of some sort. It's a natural world, world's biggest temple. So yeah. that's the sensation that people want to convey for the most part, right? So if that's the case, then what you want to have, you want to have an astrograph that gathers as much light as possible. Mm -hmm. Because with astronomical targets, you are often limited with the, with the amount of light that you can collect. As you compare it to, for example, terrestrial photography, where exposures can be like one hundredth of a second. Yeah. In astronomy, it can be, you know, tens of hours, like yeah. the total exposure time. Mm -hmm. So you want to reduce that time as much as possible by picking a telescope that is collect as much light as possible. And uh, when it comes to telescopes collecting much light, there is this uh, misconception that you just need to have big aperture. And that, strictly speaking, is not correct. What you need to have is the fastest telescope or lowest F number. So the beginning of the article actually deals with that subject. It explains uh, what, what, uh, what the F number is. Mm -hmm. It's basically like a person who was engaged, who, who engaged in the regular photography knows that there are fast lenses, there are slow lenses, and you can open the lens to like F by two or by three, when there is not enough light. The same principles apply here. You just pick an astrograph that has lowest F number. But the lowest F number is not the whole story. You also need to have what is called a large image circle. This is the area where you connect, can collect light that can give you a good image. Uh, so image circle is not something that uh, uh, manufacturers of telescope like to publish in part because it's a subjective, uh, somewhat subjective parameter. Uh, light intensity goes off at the edges of your yeah. imaging field. So how much of it are you going to tolerate is up to you. 
also it gets slightly blurry depending on telescope model yes how much blurrier it gets at the edges of the field again it's in some degree up to the astronomer so but the idea is to pick a telescope that uh, is has a low f number the so-called fast telescope and the second idea is to uh, have largest area of the image circle so for the purpose of comparing different models i've come up with this um, parameter called figure of merit where i just multiplied the two factors together okay. uh, and uh, so that 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 figure of merit and we have a table of that figure of merit for several telescopes i either had or in, in the past or currently have yeah this one uh, so this figure of merit here uh, shows how much light telescopes collect relative to one another. And you can see, for example, uh, a small lens, 135 millimeter lens, collects much more light than 11 inch to grain telescope. So if you want to get a picture that is noise free, that is like uh, high quality and inspiring, mm -hmm. then you, you can start with a, even with a camera lens. Yeah. Or with a small refractor telescopes, and there are several options available. So, uh, of course, that kind of telescope will only work with uh, uh, relatively large targets, uh, several degrees in, in, in angular size, the biggest than the moon targets, such as Andromeda Galaxy, Milky Way, maybe M33, um, Triangular Galaxy, and so on. And uh, so, the number of targets won't be as much, but as a beginning astrophotographer, you don't need many targets, right? You may need only maybe five, six targets to to get good images of. And uh, once you get a decent image of a, of a galaxy, like Andromeda Galaxy, then you can print it, you know, you can publish it, and you can inspire others. And that's the goal, basically, to convey your inspiration. So that's one way to do it. You print or publish an image. Of course, another way to do it would be to have like a star party and just bring people yeah. to your telescope and uh, you know uh, mm -hmm. and share this. I must tell you, at least half of the fun is to have somebody see like uh, Saturn for the first time yes. and see its spheres, or see Jupiter and its moons. People like get naturally, like literally, very surprised by this. Mm -hmm. That star mm -hmm. in the sky is not a star, right? It's a disk. It's yeah. always been a disk, right? <laughs> it's another planet, right? So yeah. uh, that's what brings and uh, brings the joy. And uh, so astrophotography is one way to do it, and star mm -hmm. parties is another way to do it. So in this article, I like I compare. I show several telescopes that I uh, have. Three of them I still have. One of them I upgraded. So yeah, this is the picture. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the the leftmost one is basically. Rocking on 135 millimeter camera lens. It's an amazing lens, even for regular photography. It's very fast, it's sharp, uh, and it's a manual lens. So if you put it on a tracker mount, this is all you need. And you can take images. I have in this article an image of a comet, Neowise, that I got with, uh, with, this, uh, with this, this exactly set up, this exact setup, uh, by going to a dark location somewhere on the side of a road and taking an image for maybe an hour. Nice. So the next one is a four-inch Petzval refractor. Mm -hmm. It's a famous Takahashi refractor, which is truly an amazing instrument. Really is like a joy to work with. And it's, it's the diameter is only four inches. It's a four-inch telescope. Yeah. Yet it can, uh, it, it, its image circle, I think, it's like 80 millimeters, which is huge. Wow. It's like medium format, really. It's bigger than full frame. Wow. So, and the next one, uh, if you keep scrolling, yeah, this one, uh, this is a 10 inch uh, uh, astrograph, Newtonian astrograph, um, with, which is my main imaging scope at the moment. It's an amazing scope. Um, it's f by four and a half, I think. And uh, okay. it, uh, it has, uh, and I will talk about it in a second, but it hits really what I believe like a, a sweet spot in the amateur ast astrograph. Its focal length is about one meter, it has a wide field. And it's fast enough for a telescope of this focal length. Cool. And uh, there is also a Schmidt Cassegrain telescope. If you on the next page, I think it's the leftmost picture on the next page. Yep. Top left. Yeah, this one 
this Schmidt is a grain uh, is uh, is an amazing uni universal versatile instrument. It has a focal reducer, which can bring it from f by ten to f by seven. It can also be used in a, an f by two configuration, which I don't have, but it could be used. So it's a it's also a nice scope. The only thing is not as fast as I would like it to be. So you know, and the Newtonian beats it in terms of the light gathering power, but yeah. it's still a very nice telescope, and you can do uh, planetary imaging with it as well. So. Uh, so then the second part of the article uh, deals with the resolving power of a telescope. So basically, once uh, there is a realization that you don't need large aperture to get nice pictures, right? Then the next question is, why do people have these big scopes? Like, why do they go for like larger mounts, more expensive scopes? And the reason is that you want to have bigger resolution. You want to increase the number of uh, objects that you can image. Um, and then you go up in resolution. And what's interesting to know is that you don't really need to go very high up in the resolution okay. because of so-called atmospheric seeing, which will limit your resolution uh, due to the atmosphere fluctuating all the time and acting as an unpredictable lens, which constantly changes its shape. Right. And uh, that reduces the minimum resolution to one to two arc seconds. Uh, okay. Sometimes one arc second, most of the night is closer to two arc seconds at our location. Yeah. So uh, if you consider that and, and if you ask yourself a question, what focal length do I need to get to that level of resolution with typical sensors? Okay. The answer would be about one meter focal length, like uh, that Newtonian that, uh, yeah. that you showed. Mm -hmm. So one meter focal length gives you one arc second per pixel with six micron pixels. And that means that at most seeing conditions, your stars are going to be like two to three pixels wide which makes this now nice round stars and yet uh, retains uh, most of the resolution that is attainable. Of course, you also need a sturdy mount. In this article, I don't talk about mounts, but basically you want to have a good mount oh, yeah. Yeah. At, uh, with low periodic error, maybe starting from Lozman D and up, if you want, if you want to be serious about astrophotography. Uh, a good mount will shave off additional, maybe portion of an arc second from your images even more. Also nice. very good mounts don't require any tweaking. I'm using Losman D which requires tweaking, but I like tweaking, so no problem there. Uh, but if you don't want to bother with tweaking, I heard, uh, what is it called? Uh, astrophysics mounts are pretty good. Yes. Heard from several people. Uh, so that's basically the route. You can start with a small refractor, which is light, doesn't require any collimation. And uh, basically, is basically like a camera lens. And if you cross from regular photography, it's going to be very easy to do because it's basically like a camera lens. And once you are, you have imaged uh, all the main objects, all the biggest and brightest nebula and galaxies, then you can decide: Am I up to a, you know, a bigger telescope? I want to image smaller objects. And then you can switch to uh, a Newtonian, something I would personally prefer, or to maybe Dow Curtin telescope, which also has pretty big image circle, uh, mm -hmm. or any other uh, Cassegrain type telescope. So uh, one more thing uh, that I make a point about is uh, you want to buy a telescope with a large image circle upfront. Maybe it's a small refractor because even if your first astronomical camera has a small sensor, it gives you a room to grow such that you can eventually oh. go to full frame sensor. Okay. And uh, just just remember, it, uh, increasing your sensor size, sensor area by a factor of two is equivalent to having two telescopes basically. So uh, uh, in that sense, you have a room to grow without purchasing another telescope. Yeah. Uh, but uh, uh, of course, then you can then you can grow to uh, a larger telescope at focal length of at least one meter, uh, if if your hobby takes off. And uh, you know, and it is an amazing hobby. I see, like during last two years, I see a lot more people getting into this hobby. Uh, you can see, and the quality has improved dramatically. Um, not least because of uh, better cameras. Now, see, most cameras. Yeah, uh, have, are achieving 
and outperforming CCD cameras, we, we, we finally re reached that moment when it happens. And we have large CMOS cameras which have big AD ADCs, high efficiency, very large areas, and so somehow they manage even cost less than CCD cameras. So I think we reached that cross point and a lot of people can buy now these cameras. Yeah. I think in the past what happened, people didn't go to astrophotography because it was expensive. Yes. Nowadays, the price point come down so much yeah. and the software improved so much that you can literally like do this deep sky images that 20, 30 years ago, you could only get from like an observatory. Yeah. And that makes it so much more exciting. Enjoyable, <laughs> yeah. This is a fascinating image here with these uh, squares and these detector sizes. Right. This is, uh, this is basically meant to illustrate what uh, getting to a larger sensor gets you. It's uh, from the same telescope with a focal length of 850 millimeters and has different uh, sensor sizes. You can see that full frame can get you the entire galaxy at this focal length and the smaller sensors get you uh, uh, like only portions of the galaxy, which of course you can uh, image them portion by portion and then have a mosaic. Yeah, yeah. And then it will be big also, but it will take longer. So, so basically, yeah, you can start with a smaller sensor. You can start with a smaller telescope, see if that fits you. And uh, for many people who are like technically inclined, like work in high tech, like I do, uh, and they have this artsy side, artsy side to them, <laughs> such that you know they take pictures of you know they go to Arizona and take pictures of uh, <laughs> national parks there or mountains. Or yeah, saguaro cactuses or something, right? Right, right. So that's that's if you like that, you will like astrophotography. You will love astrophotography. I'm pretty sure. So that's the message, really. That's and I was really happy to see that I have now a possibility to convey that message. Yes. So, um, once you get uh, started, so let's talk. Let's keep on the getting started. So, so once you have the image, then you have to, as you brought out, to um, to sort of raise the art level. You have to process the image. So, what do yeah. you what do you currently use, or what would you recommend for for starters for people to process their images? Um, to bring out whatever well, faint details or features they want to bring out? Well, I, I tried several packages. In my opinion, uh, software called PixInsight definitely is amazing compared okay. to what I saw, anything else. They have very nice uh, stretching function, which uh, basically a nonlinear transformation of the image that brings out the faint details. Different software packages have different stretching algorithms, but uh, stretching algorithm of PixInsight is truly amazing. Okay. It brings out these faint details. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how it works, but as a user, you don't need to know that. Like this image, for example, shows it shows the difference of f4 versus f10 telescope. So you need more right. images on the right to arrive at an image on the left. Then you add them together arithmetically. Add them together. Mm -hmm. It's called stacking. Mm -hmm. And then you increase your signal more than you increase your noise, and the signal to noise increases. So uh, yep. Pix inside is good for stacking, is good for processing, for stretching, and so on. And you can very quickly, it, the software is not very, I would say it's not extremely user-friendly, but you can get through this rather quickly and then it becomes paying off. It's, uh, you can get these nice images. Uh, we use monochrome images in this article just to illustrate the point, but you can get color images, you can get narrow band images, and so on. Right, that's a great shot of Neowise there. Very nice. Very nice. Cool. Cool. Very nice. So Oleg. Yeah. Where do people go given this great introductory article on picking an astrograph? Uh, do you anticipate doing uh, astrograph two? Is there gonna be a second article on the next step in that journey or what should people do? Well, I have several ideas. Um, maybe describe choosing a sensor. That would be one. Also, some of the ideas on uh, processing deep sky images and also on uh, planetary imaging. Mm. Planetary imaging compared to deep sky is much more hands-on. So 
So for people who like tweaking things and get maximum out of their equipment, planetary imaging is probably better. Also for people who live in the cities, planetary imaging is better because of light pollution. You don't really right. suffer from light pollution in planetary images. In fact, you can image planets during the day. So, uh, um, so I was I was thinking about writing an article about that. Um, what to pay attention to for high resolution planetary images. Also, there are quite a few misconceptions about out there. But the, the point is you can reach your resolution uh, limit and uh, maybe even slightly exceed it because there are the convolution techniques out there. Yes. Which enable you to peek to some believable faint details of planets, mm -hmm. which becomes uh, also a major obsession for people. I know planetary photographers are a separate group of astrophotographers. <laughs> it's uh, really proud <laughs> in their techniques and uh, in what they can achieve. <laughs> Oh, that's great. That's fantastic. Well, that's great. I look forward to, uh, to seeing that. And I want to thank you so much for spending some time and walking us through your, your really great article today. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. It's uh, wonderful. Spreading the joy of astrophotography. That's, that's what it is about. <laughs> Spread the joy. All right, everyone. Thank you so much. And we'll see you on the next one. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.